So Father, we pray, we thank you, Lord, for your love. We thank you, Jesus. As we said earlier, you are the way, you are the truth, you are the life. As Paul would defend the gospel, as he would write letters and he writ to the Galatians, Lord, I just pray every word that is spoken now would be uh, standing on the truth of your word, standing on the truth of the gospel, that it would penetrate even the hardest of hearts. But Lord, it would encourage the, encourage the believers, encourage the body. It would strengthen us and help us to continue to move forward in you. We love you, Jesus. We give you the glory and the praise. Amen. 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 So yeah, first of all, it is um, good to be back with you guys. Um, I, do, I do love traveling and seeing the different churches and that, but you know that, what's the one? She goes like this. There's no place like home. Oh, Wizard of Oz would only use that too as an example. <laughs> Woo! What am I doing? Um, yeah, she clipped her, her heels and said, there's no place like home. Take the, the wizard bit out of it, please. But um, yeah, there's no place like home. And so when you come back into your home, it's like, oh, Lord, just leave me here for a bit. And so it's good to be with you. And thank you again, I say, for, for all that you're doing behind the scenes. Everyone that just picks up the baton and just keeps running and keeps going. And you don't moan and you don't complain and you don't say, oh, where's the pastor this week? You just get on with it. And so I really appreciate it because I think that's why God placed me with you guys. That's not a knock at any other church. I'm just saying that's why I think God placed me with you guys. There's something about when we came here two years ago, just 20 of us came to, to start the church and just get on with it. That we had that kind of planting mentality. We had that kind of like, we're here to work. We're here to work. If I was in another church that's already established and just already doing life, maybe they would want the old tradition or I need my pastor to come and visit me every other day or I need him to be at every doctor's appointment or I need him to do this and I need him to do that. And actually that's not the role that God's called me to do and you release me to go and do what God's called me to do. So I genuinely appreciate you guys. Galatians chapter 1 took place first before Galatians chapter 2. And so what the letter was about is Paul wrote a letter. He'd planted a church in Galatia. By the way, it was plural, so it's in Galatia. There was churches. You're thinking Antioch, Lystra, Derby. So you've got churches. He plants a church or plants the churches, then goes away back into Jerusalem. And all of a sudden, uh, stuff starts to take place. And so he hears of these things and he comes back and he says, what has crept into this church? And what had happened is somebody or people called the, un the circumcision group or Judaizers, it's the same people. They're basically Jews that believe in Christ, believe in that side, but believe that you must be circumcised first, that you must obey things of the law. So you have to eat certain foods or you can't eat certain foods. And you have to follow certain seasons and days. And they'd come into the church and they'd said to the, the people that had been saved, the Jerusalem church has come into Antioch, let's say, and they've said, guys, you're not really Christians until you've become a Jew first. So you have to abide by certain things of the Jewish law and then you can be a Christian. So it's the gospel plus. And I always say, if anybody says it's anything else, if there's anything added onto the gospel, then it is no gospel at all. And Paul comes into this letter and he starts the letter and he's really quite angry and he's like, what, what are you going on about? Like, my name's Paul, I'm an apostle and I've been put in this position by the revelation that I got of the gospel through Jesus himself. So don't tell me there's another gospel. Don't tell me that there's anything extra that you can add on to it. Why are you putting these people into bondage? And so he really fights against it. And then we find ourselves in Galatians chapter 2. And literally, we're taking a verse at a time. I've got a clock in front of me. I'll give myself a set time. Don't worry. It won't be more than usual just because I haven't been here for a while. So um, we'll take it a verse at a time. Hopefully we'll get through the whole chapter. But if we don't, I'll pick up on it the next time. So Galatians chapter 2, verse 1. 
Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and also took Titus with me. Barnabas, his real name was Joseph. I don't know if you know that. I don't know if that even matters. But think about like his real name was Joseph. He was nicknamed Barnabas, if you like. The disciples nicknamed him Barnabas, which means sons of encouragement. Everybody needs a Barnabas in their life. Every one of us needs a Barnabas in our lives. I need a Barnabas in my life. I seem to get more Judases than Barnabases, though, Barnabases. <laughs> but um, I need a Barnabas in my life. A Haley, she needs a Barnabas in her life. Saba needs a Barnabas in her life. Luke needs a Barnabas. You know what Luke is to me? I think Luke's like a Titus. Titus is like that faithful uh, minister of Paul's. He's, he like worked alongside Paul and... Paul would take him to all the difficult places. And he'd say, um, there's Crete, or, or, or there's somewhere else. Like, These are difficult, Corinth, that was another one. There's Corinth, you go and do some work there. Not that I'm saying Birmingham's difficult, like in a bad way. But you know what I mean. He was a faithful um, co-worker with Paul. And Paul could go do what he needed to do and know that Titus was going to be doing what was needed. And so we all need a Barnabas as an encourager. But in ministry, I think we all kind of need a Titus as well. And we need Tituses. And Sabah's going to need people around her that are like a Titus. But she's going to need a Barnabas as well because she's going to need people to encourage her because she's going to get pulled down. And people are going to say all sorts of things about her. And so we need that in life. Wayne's going to need a Barnabas. Wayne's going to need a Titus, people to work alongside. Martin's going to need it. We all need it. We all need it. And Paul says in verse 2, I went up by revelation. Where it says I went up, you know, um, when they go up to Jerusalem, everywhere is up to Jerusalem, by the way. Everywhere. They think um, Jerusalem like the centre of the earth. It's the holy city. So the Jews will always say, don't matter what direction you go from, it's you're going up up to Jerusalem. Anyway, that's just me giving you a useless bit of information. And I went up by revelation and communicated to them that the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to those who were of reputation, least by any means I might run or had run in vain. He's going with the simple gospel. The simple gospel. Jesus Christ, he came. He died. He was buried. He rose again. He defeated death. It's a gift of grace that covers all sin. The Bible says where the mountain of sin is, the mountain of grace is even bigger. You see, it's not by works that a man is saved, but by the grace of God. But when you give your life to Jesus, you can't help but do good things for God. So you're not saved by good works, but you are saved for good works. In the book of Ephesians, it says that God has prepared good works in advance for you to do. So good works come into it, but we're not saved by those good works. We're saved by the free gift, the grace of God, because each one of us is a sinner. And the Bible says every single one of us has fallen short of the glory of God. There's not one righteous person amongst us. We needed Christ to come. We needed him to pay the penalty. We needed him to say, look, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So I'll pay the price. And he comes, he takes your sin, he takes your punishment, he gets upon a cross, he dies for you. He could have called a legion of angels and took it out, but he went the way for you. He became obedient to death. Obedient. Why? Because that's how much he thinks of each and every one of you. You know, if you feel like in life you don't have a Barnabas, remember what Christ did on the cross for you. Let that be an encouragement to you. Let that be your Barnabas in that moment that my king would die for me. My king would pay it all for me. Undeserving me and he still he gave it all for me. And what did I do with my life yesterday? What did you do with your spare time yesterday? What did you do last week? Do we live like we're so grateful and thankful that our king should die for us? Paul went with the simple, simple gospel, saved by grace, a gift from God, not by works. Verse 3, it says, Yet not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. Verse 4 goes on. 
in a moment it goes on to say, and this occurred because of false brethren secretly brought in who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus that they might bring us into bondage. You see, the law kept them in bondage. Let me ask you a question. What is in your past that is keeping you in bondage? What is in your past that keeps dragging you back in? What is it that's in your past that keeps pulling you back in? It's bondage, it's chains. We want to break those chains. You see, the, the, gift of, the gift of life that we received through Christ, for the Jews, when they received God, that bondage was the law, and it can now be broken and cut in half, and you no longer have to go there. It's the free gift. You don't live by that now. It's the grace of God that you live by. Those things, the Ten Commandments, they showed us what sin was. And the other, there were 613 laws, to be fair, that you had to abide by. No man could keep them. That's why we needed a saviour to come. And he did away. But those, those laws, those Ten Commandments, Jesus takes them and goes, let's go even further. It's not about thou shalt not murder. It's about you should not become angry in your heart now. I'm going to knock it up a step. If you thought the law was difficult, living under Jesus' law would be even more but there's a grace and there's a gift. And God says, I know you're going to stumble. But the righteous man falls seven times and seven times he gets back up. Keep your eyes on me. Keep a repentant heart. If you go down, you get up and you say, God, forgive me. What does repentance mean? Repentance doesn't mean uh, cry and say sorry. That can be part of repentance. But repentance is I was walking in this direction. I fell over and I said, God, forgive me. And he said, get up. I got up. And he says, now turn in the other direction. Turn away from it. Turn away from it. That's repentance. I was a drug addict. I asked God to forgive me. He helped me. He got me up off my feet and he turned me away from it. I can't keep going back to my drugs. I can't keep being an addict. I can't do it. The Bible says uh, it's like a, a dog that returns to its vomit. What is the vomit that you keep returning to? What is it that's keeping you in bondage? We need to deal with this. Paul's emphasis on freedom in Christ was central. So important. We will just jump into Acts chapter 13 there. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins. And by him, everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Paul says, look, guys, the law is not going to get you justified. The law is not going to sustain you. The law is an added on. It is not the gospel plus. That is not the gospel of Jesus. There is no, I'm going to give my life to Jesus and by good works, I'm going to earn my way into heaven or by good works, I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. As if like it's about your glory, about your name. It's not, and sometimes we can get a false humility, which can be quite as bad. A false humility like, you know, I sometimes hear preachers saying, and again, I understand what they're doing, but I always think this, you know, when somebody's preached and they say, wasn't me, that wasn't me, that was all God. And I think, mm, it's a little bit false, because I'm sure if Jesus would have come down, he could have done a better job than that. <laughs> <laughs> if you think about it. It's not that it was a bad preach. At the end of here, I hope that we can go away and say, that, that was good teaching, that was, that was good, that's helped, that's encouraged me, that's made me want to go deeper in. But if I say, I didn't speak really, that was completely God, I think you'd be like able to pick that apart as a false humility. Like I say, I understand what they're saying, I understand. But I just think sometimes in life, maybe that's an extreme that I'm using, but sometimes in life we say, no, no, it's all God. It's God did all that. God did all that. And actually, God directs you in a certain direction, but there's a part for you to play. I've said this so many times, like, you know, Jesus, he rose Lazarus from the dead. But who rolled away the stone? You rolled away the stone. Jesus, he turned water into wine. But who put the water into the jars? You put the water into the jars. There's a work for us to do. It's kind of like you do what you can do and God steps in and does what you can't do. 
And so, in this bit, it's like the gospel on its own, nothing else added to it, nothing else added to it. It's the gospel, the simple gospel. It's what's going to save a man. Galatians 5 verse 1, it says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. And do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Again, before we move on to verse 5 of Galatians chapter 2, I'll say to you, what is it that you're in bondage with? What is it from your past that you keep going back to? What is it that you gave your life to Jesus, but there's something there that you've kept hold of? Maybe it's a sin in your life. Maybe it's a routine. Maybe it's something really stupid like superstition. Have you, you know those stupid superstitious things? Before I'd go out for a football match, before I'd play, I would do like a certain superstitious thing. Like, when I look back at it, I think, well, how stupid. I just copied that off other people that did it, if I'm honest. But how about when we were younger and we wouldn't walk under a, a ladder or we wouldn't walk under a certain signpost or we wouldn't step on a crack in the path? Or we wouldn't cross on the stairs. These superstitions, these, oh, that's bad luck, that's this. It's rubbish. It's a load of rubbish, but it plays on us and we keep it. And we keep bound to these stupid things. And some of you probably still do this. You say to somebody, you say, oh, touch wood. <laughs> it's stupid. Charlie, stop touching wood. <laughs> touch wood. Touch wood, it won't happen. Fingers crossed. How many of you still I had my fingers crossed? You know when you was a kid and you had your fingers behind your back telling a lie to your teacher? I didn't, I didn't steal the pen, miss. Fingers behind your back. Because if you've got your fingers crossed, it doesn't mean it's a lie. Andrea, does any of this make sense to you? or No. Is this just English? Okay. Uh, and Brazil, okay. Makes sense. Oh, Maria, I didn't see you at the back. I would have gone to you instead of pretending Andrea's my friend. <laughs> Superstition. What else is keeping you in bondage? Verse, verse 5, are we on Galatians 2, verse 5? To whom we did not yield submission even for an hour that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Verse 6. But from those who seem to be something, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. It doesn't matter what comes against me, this gospel will stand true. It doesn't matter what comes or what people say, this assignment that God has given to you, you won't let anything knock you off course. I could write it like that. And then he goes on in verse 6, because we haven't finished it, it goes that God shows no favouritism. God shows no personal favouritism to no man. For those who seem to be something added nothing to me. This word favouritism, I think we all think we don't show favouritism and we're quite, we're quite good in certain areas. And then sometimes we get seen. We get seen when we stand next to someone that's more pure, if you like, in that, in that area of their life. And then you think to yourself, actually, I'm not as good with that as I thought I was. When I look at the mirror... I think that's like what the law could be like back in those days, like a mirror, that you look at the law and it, the mirror reflects, what are you doing? Well, what are you doing? And does it add up? And so with favouritism, in the book of James, it says that God has no favourites. And he says, imagine, chapter 2, James, it says, imagine if a rich man, a poor man, walks into your meeting. If you say to the rich man, hey... Come here. Come sit at the front. But to the poor man that walks in, you say, um, do you want to go to the back? Go, go to the back. Sit at, the, sit at my feet. Sit on the floor. Why do you show favouritism? God hates favouritism. There is no favourites in heaven. There is no favourites on earth. There's no favourites in God's eyes. And when you, when you think about that as a body right now, there's no one can say, so and so always lands on his feet. He's blessed by God and God doesn't see me the same because God sees us all the same. He doesn't look to Luke and say, oh, I like Luke, I prefer Luke. 
over Sarah. He doesn't say that. I might say that. I might struggle with that. But not God. He doesn't say, oh, Saba. I prefer Saba than Kim. He, he doesn't say that. And so even when the world has always pushed us to the back, pushed us and pushed us and pushed us, and we feel like I'm always at the back of the queue. I'm never, never needed, never wanted. What about that song? I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody all about somebody that saved my soul. And what does it say? It says, I was always at the back of the queue. All my life I've been standing at the back of the queue. But wow, I'm paraphrasing the lyrics here. But, but wow, I didn't realise that's the one that God always called. Those are the people God always calls, the ones standing at the back of the queue, the nobodies of this world, the one that everyone's overlooked. If people have overlooked you in life, don't you worry. Don't you worry because God sees you with the same set of eyes as he sees the man down the road that's, that's planted a thousand churches for him. He doesn't have a scales like your good deeds, your bad deeds. Oh, your scales are up. I'm going to love you a bit more. It's not like that. When he looks at you, he sees his son, the Bible says. He said, you've been clothed in righteousness. When you gave your life to Christ, he no longer sees you, but he sees Christ living through you. He sees his son, like reflecting back. When we stand before him, he won't see our rotten sin. Because as far as the east is from the west, that's how far it's been removed. Don't ever think that God has favourites. My Bible tells me that God has no favourites. And so I know he has no favourites. For the next passage, let's read 7, 8, 9 and get us to 10. Verse 7. But on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcised had been committed to me, as the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter, for he who worked effectively in, the, in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised also worked effectively in me towards the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, Cephas, in other words, Paul, um, Peter, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that had been given to me. They gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Paul, Barnabas, Go tell the Gentiles, Gentiles, everyone that's not a Jew. Go and tell anyone that's not a Jew about Jesus. That's your ministry. Peter over here, my ministry will be to the Jews. Okay, we've all got a part to play. Everybody in the room, we've got a part to play. Not everyone's going to have the same ministry, but we're all on the same team. We're in the same army. Verse 10, it says, They desired only that we should remember the poor, the very thing which I was also eager to do. Remember the poor. Okay, we get to remember the poor quite often with some of our churches that we support. Burundi is the poorest country in the world. It came in the top three um, most poor countries in the whole world for the last I don't know how many years. We get that opportunity to support places like Burundi and Mozambique and other places. And we've got poor amongst us. We've got poor around us. We get the opportunity to look after the poor. I want to show you some because we sometimes miss this. But first of all, James 1.27, it says that religion that God or pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. But it's to look after orphans and widows. In the NIV, it says religion that God sees as pure and faultless is to look after uh, basically the poor, the orphans, the widows, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Remember Sodom and Gomorrah? Sodom and Gomorrah, we all know it to be there was such sexual sin in the place. And with the world we live in today, we see this kind of behaviour happening in today's world. And we're so quick to point out the one sin that came from Sodom and Gomorrah, and that was a lot of homosexual behaviour going on. And a man would sleep with a man and a woman with a woman, and they did a lot of unnatural um, practices. 
And God said, look, because of what's happening in this place, there was rape going on, there was all sorts going on. But everyone jumps on this one point. But in Ezekiel, he shows us another point as well. Look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter had pride, fullness of food and an abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. God took out Sodom and Gomorrah, not just for the one sin, although in Jude, is it Jude 1 verse 7? Just so we don't try and like water it down, because I don't want to water it down in this age that we live in. But it says, Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality. It's sexual immorality that was the primary sin in Sodom and Gomorrah and added sins to that, added extras, if you like, were things like not looking after the poor, being prideful. The reason why I throw Jude 1.7 in is because I don't want anyone to take from this. Ah, so it's not about that. It's about the poor. It's about the need. It's about pride. No, it's about all of it. It's like when it says in the New Testament, if, if you fail at one part of the law, then you fail all the law. If, if you commit murder, then you failed the law. So you've broken the whole law. You only had to mess up one thing in the law and you were a lawbreaker. Jesus had to come because man couldn't keep going. They couldn't. It was for temporary, a temporary purpose until Christ had come. Remember the poor church. Verse 11, it goes on to talk about, Now when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. Peter, we've stand, we'll talk about why, what it, that's about in a moment, but there's a little principle there. Verse 11, now when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. Notice that he went to his face. He said, like, Haley, me and you got an issue, we need to talk. He went to his face. He didn't go, Luke, let me tell you an issue about Haley. He didn't go behind Haley's back. He didn't go, oh, let me write this on social media and tell the world what I think of this person. What do we do today? We talk behind each other's backs or we go to social media and put our differences down on the, on the platform so the whole world can look at it and say, I don't want to go to church. Those Christians bicker so much. And yet, the principle from Matthew 18 is if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you've gained a brother. If I wronged Luke, I know Luke would get in touch with me and say, Aaron, can we meet up? I just want to chat something through with you. I know that's what he would do. I know that he wouldn't go to Charlie and say, oh, Charlie, Aaron's done this. Charlie probably would go around people, <laughs> but I know Luke wouldn't. And so, principle, go to their face. You don't need to go aggressively. You need to go with this like, that's my brother, that's my sister. They might not have acted like it in the last thing that's brought me to them, but they're still, they're a daughter or a son of a king. My father in heaven is their father in heaven. And we need to sort this out for the, the goodness of the kingdom. We have to drop our pride at times, because a lot of the time it's our pride that's stopping us from going to see someone. Sometimes it's fear of confrontation, because we don't like confrontation. And I, I get that, I understand that. But if somebody ever comes to you with an issue and they say, look, you've offended me here, no matter what you think about it, don't be conf confrontational with them. Especially if it's taken them like a big effort to come and talk to you. And then you come back on your defensive and you're irate and you come up here and your face goes a little bit red and you look nothing like Jesus would want. We'd look more like the world. We might as well write our argument on Facebook and let them join in with us. And the enemy sits there, just clapping his hands, going, they've done it again for me. They've done it again for me. Disunity. Satan, it means divider, splitter. He wants to split. But Jesus brings unity. At the same time, someone will shout out, the, Jesus said, I didn't come to unite everything, but I came to split, to divide, turn a mother against a daughter and a son against a father. 
that's with the gospel. That's in my household. My prayer is that my whole family would know Christ. My whole family will know Christ. And I'll keep praying that and I'll keep believing that my children will walk with God as well. Uh, all the days of their life. That will be my prayer always. It will never change. But the gospel does split families, doesn't it? Let's be honest. When, when the gospel is given, one man would say, I believe, I believe, I believe. And another man would say, you stupid, you're crazy. They're brainwashing you. And it's split. It's split. We've all experienced it. We've all experienced But Christ does want unity within the body of Christ. There will be division out there. There will be division. But Christ wants unity in the body. With all of us. We are stronger together, church. We're stronger together. We are. Whether you like it or not. It's very difficult for me to say this, but... I'm stronger with Andrea. <laughs> oh no, sorry, I misheard the Holy Spirit then. No, sorry, not you, Andrea. No, I'm stronger with Andrea on my team and she's stronger with me on her team and she's got qualities that I don't have and I have a lot more qualities than she doesn't have. And we, we have these and Kim's got these qualities and Hayley's got qualities. Andy's got qualities. Sabah's got qualities. Luke's got qualities. Aid. What's he doing on the stage? Go on, Aid. Aid's got qualities. They've all got qualities. David's got qualities. They've all got qualities. Together we're stronger and we stand side by side and we use all our qualities for the glory of God. We are stronger. So what would the enemy do? Let's knock some of these people out the line. Let's knock some of these, let's knock Sabah out the line. Then they're going to have a problem with the Iranian church. Who will look after the Iranian church? Let's knock Haley out the line. Who have problems then? Let's knock Charlie out the line. Actually bring him back in. He's good in the house. Um, <laughs> knock Aid out the line. Knock Luke out the line. Knock people out the line. They cause these little divots, little holes in the line, in the chink of the armour now. We are stronger together. If we can just be like those redwood trees. Remember the redwood trees? Tallest trees in the world, but their roots, they don't grow very deep at all. Like 100 feet up, 50 feet up, whatever it is. I think it's 90 actually. 90 feet up, whatever. But their roots only go like less than a metre down. How do they stand? Because they grow out. The roots grow out. And the roots grab onto the next redwood tree next to it. And their roots grab onto the next one. And their roots grab onto the next one. So when the wind and the storm comes, these redwood trees just hold each other's roots underground. And the wind blows and the storms comes. And those redwood trees don't move. or They, they may wobble, but they don't fall. But a single redwood tree on its own, you'd have no roots to grab onto. The wind would take it down. It's oversized. But when we stand together, united, we are so much stronger. Leaders have a responsible. We see here that Peter comes to Antioch. He withstands um, Paul, withstands Peter to his face in Antioch because he was to be blamed. We see that leaders have a responsible, a responsibility not to be quiet if they see another leader misrepresenting the truth. Leaders have a responsibility to stand up and say something. They have that responsibility. And yet we look at Peter's life and I just want us to remember that Jesus knew all Peter's mistakes. Jesus knew the mistakes that Peter was going to make. And yet Jesus chose Peter on Pentecost to go win 3,000 people. Jesus chose Peter. Peter, like Peter planted the first church in Jerusalem, the 3,000, like literally in the upper room, 120, and it just increases. Like Peter was right there at the beginning, and Jesus is saying to Peter, do you love me? I love you. Do you love me? I love you. Do you love me? I love you. I said I love you. Okay, go build this church. Go look after the sheep. And yet Peter has denied Jesus three times. Peter has put his foot in his mouth. Peter told, like, Jesus, you, nah, you're not going on the cross. Like, nah, nah, you're not doing that. Remember when, the, when the, in Acts, Peter receives a vision and it says a sheet 
came down out of the sky and he heard God say, Peter, get up, kill and eat. Peter, the first words Peter says, no, Lord. But those two words don't go together, do they? <laughs> no, Lord. That's like Hezekiah talking to Wayne. No. <laughs> um, go to bed now. No. Okay, that's, that's acceptable-ish. But, no, Lord. Uh, Jonah, what are you doing? Like, go over here. Uh, no, Lord. But those words don't come. And yet, God says, Peter, I'm going to use you. Verse 12, for before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles, but when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision will carry on, and I'll paraphrase it all in a moment. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, if you being a Jew live in the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? We who were Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law no flesh has been justified. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are found sinners, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. This whole, this whole passage that we just quickly read, read to leave us with two verses to finish, this whole passage... Peter, he started the church up in Jerusalem. The 120, they're all, they're all Jews. They've all lived under the law. It's really difficult. All they've ever known is to be under the law. And now they've been told, you've got freedom in Christ. So that's got to be like difficult with them. It's like, I don't know, I've always eaten a certain way. And now you're saying I can have a bacon sandwich? Like that? No, that doesn't make sense. Surely not. Like, now you're saying I can eat... No, no, surely no. You're saying I don't have to observe, observe certain days? No, 613 laws I've tried to live by all my life. And now you're saying I don't need to live by those specific things? I've got a routine. I'm a man of routine. I get up at a certain time, I go to bed at a certain time. Try and knock that routine out of me. You can talk to Israel, the Brazilian pastor. Whenever we go anywhere, it doesn't matter where we are in the world, he knows at a certain time I'm going to bed. Because I want to get up early in the morning, spend time with God. And whereas more of the Brazilian culture, they seem to like to spend a bit more time together. That's right. Like socialize a bit more, eat lots of food, um, talk into the early hours of the night. And then still get up early. Well, not necessarily as early as I wanted to, but early. They still get up and get on with the day. Uh, and I don't work like that. I've got a routine. It's like, I'll stay with you till 10 and then I'm off. And it's like, okay. And Israel will be like, we need to get the pastor back to the hotel. We need to get the pastor back home. Or we need to do this. Like, he knows my routine. I've got to see my routine. I'm not being rude. Oh, I'll give my time, but after a certain time, I'm grumpy and you don't want me around. Like, just go home, Aaron. You're ruining the party now. Get out of here. That's who I am. I want to go and spend some time with God before I get into bed. And then when I wake up first thing in the morning, I want to be on my knees and saying, God, thank you that you placed breath in my lungs today. Thank you. There's a world out there that doesn't know you. Holy Spirit, what do you want me to do today? That's my routine. And that's just been a routine over several years. Peter has lived under the law all his life. And now he's got to change his whole routine. And so when he was with the Gentiles, he went to Antioch. Antioch would have been like a mixed church, Gentiles and Jews. So people that have come to Christ and are living under this freedom instantly. Others that were once under the law and are really struggling with, can I do this, can I not? They're battling stuff through. That's okay. Don't worry, that, that's part of the journey. And Peter's with them. And he's eating with them. And they're eating all the different types of food together. And then the Christians or the Jews from Jerusalem come down. 
And when Peter sees them coming, all of a sudden he changes everything. He probably changed the way the tables were set out. He probably had the um, Gentile Christians up in the corner over there and the Jews over here. And all of a sudden it's hypocrisy. When those Jews weren't there, Peter would eat with the Gentiles. But now the Jews have turned up, his original people, he's like, I've got to leave you. I look bad in front of these. And so he goes with them and hypocrisy comes in. And the Bible says that even Barnabas was led astray. You see, even the most faithful and most righteous people can be led astray when hypocrisy comes into the church. The church is full of hypocrisy, by the way. The church is full of hypocrisy. I'd love to start sharing a few hypocritical things. But I've talked about Charlie enough today. <laughs> I don't want to use any more of his life. I'm glad that I've got Charlie in the room today, haven't I? I was like, Lord, give, give me someone I can use. And he gave me Charlie. Again. Again. <laughs> Good friends. Charlie's, oh, he's going, he's leaving. He says he's actually got someone on his back that says here to serve or here to help. Was it here to serve? Here to serve. So he served us today as an example of what not to be as a servant of Christ. And so we see now that Peter has caused this hypocrisy that has now led Barnabas to go astray. And Paul's gone, I've got to deal with this. Remember the principle from verse 11 was go directly to someone's face alone. But now Paul says, I'm going to have to deal with this in front of everyone because we've now got a leader that has come up and said, gospel plus, gospel plus. Plus, you want to be a Christian, but you've got to live by certain Mosaic laws. You've got to live by certain of the laws. And Paul says, we can't have that. And so because the whole church heard this leader saying this and acting in this way, now Paul goes in a different direction. And it says in verse 14, before them all, his usual advice would be go in secret. But this time he takes on something that he, he wrote in 1 Timothy 5.20. And it says to the leaders, he was talking to leaders and he says, Those who are sinning, rebuke in the presence of all, that the rest also may fear. Make an example of a leader in front of everyone. If they were sinning in front of like the church, they were doing things, bringing in wrong teaching. You'd have to rebuke that in front of the church, otherwise people could go astray. Seems pretty harsh, but it needed to be done, especially in those early times. How much more today? The problem we have today is everyone thinks they're called to expose evil because we've got Facebook. So you've got these heresy hunters running after just about anybody and everybody and saying everyone's a false prophet and everyone gets caught with it. I've had my fair share of I'm a false this and a false that and I preach a false gospel well, I don't, let's be honest. You know the gospel that I preach? I preach the one that comes out of the Bible. It's not false, but you get people that just jump on the back and they want to see something. They don't understand how a church has grown from 25 people to 25 congregations in less than seven years. And so they go, something's wrong there. False. <laughs> or... Because the Brazilian church like to use a smoke machine and I don't like to use one. Does it make the Brazilian church false? No. It just means that they use a smoke machine and we don't. I don't care how you worship. I used to worry about that kind of stuff. I used to. If there was lights, if there was camera, if there was too much what looked like entertainment... I would run a mile from it and I'd have so much to say and I'd let the world know and i think that I was standing up for Jesus and actually I was pulling down the work of God just because they had a different way of worshipping than I do. I thought my way was the right way and how many times do we do that church and now it doesn't matter where I go. If you're with people that... You just know that they're followers of Jesus. You know they're worshipping. I don't care if they've got face paint on. I don't care if it's smoke machines, if there's lights, if there's cameras, if, it, if we're in a hut, if we've just got like one bongo drum or, or whatever. I don't care. 
We're connected by one spirit, one Lord, one baptism, one Jesus, one Christ. It doesn't, it doesn't matter, but we get so et up with preference. I went to, on Friday night, Mike Chambers was doing a rap night. My days, totally different, but I guarantee if certain people went there, they wouldn't be able to cope. They'd say, what is this? We actually had one person uh, send unnecessary messages about, what's this? In God's house type thing. Oh, grow up. <laughs> Get a life. I prefer that he does it the way he does it than the way you're not doing it. So, with all my heart, go back under that rock you just crawled out of. Who cares? We've got different ways of sharing Christ. We need Mike Chambers to go share Jesus the way he does it. And we need Luke to share Jesus the way he does it. And we need me to do it the way I do it. And Charlie to do it the way he does it. And Tony to do it the way he does it. There's many, many ways that we can do it. As long as the message is the same. We've got a different generation. My daughter says the Brazilian worship is like top. It's, it's so much. She said to me the first time she came to the Brazilian church, she went, Dad, like, sorry about this to our worship team, but I think our worship team is like really good. But she said, Dad, if your worship team could do that, I would go to church as well. <laughs> and I says, do what? And she went, you know, like the smoke and the, the lights are flashing. She said, it's like a party. Several years ago, if you'd have said to me, party, disco, nightclub, connected it to a church, you would get a, a long paragraph of everything that's wrong with it. But if that's what would win a young person, is it the worst thing in the world? Just because we don't like, you don't need to go. But we don't need to pull them down because they do it different to us. We, we don't need to. And yet, so often, especially with Facebook today, we just have Christians just pulling other people down just because they do it different. I just don't understand it and I just think the enemy's winning. And at the same time, I hold my hands up, there is many things that are entertainment and are fleshy and aren't Jesus. There's a lot of that out there as well. There's a lot of that out there as well. And so we have to discern between what is okay and what's not. But let's not worry about styles. Let's not worry about styles. And like I said at the beginning of the, the talk today, or before I did the talk, I said to Tyler, beautiful voice, amazing voice Tyler has. Amazing voice. I think she's just getting better and better and better. But if her lifestyle doesn't add up, who cares about a pretty voice? Put the bottom of my heart. Like, it means nothing when it comes to worship if a lifestyle doesn't stay with it, doesn't go in line with it. And that's what we should be looking at in people, not their styles, not the way they do things. We should be looking at their lifestyle and saying, does the fruit bring Jesus? How, I don't understand how we can be so hated by so many different people just being LBC. I don't get it because I always say to people when they say stuff about us, I just say, look at the fruit. Look at the fruit. If the, a, be, a bad tree don't bear good fruit, and a good tree doesn't bear bad fruit. If we've got bad fruit, fair dues. But if we're planting churches and fulfilling the vision that God gave us, I don't see what the issue is. I, I don't see what the problem is. But that everyone knows better. Everyone knows better. Anyway, I think we should probably wrap up because I've gone off on one in a different direction. And when that happens... I take too much time up. Let's go finish on verse 21. Let's go right to verse 21. We, we should listen to what Paul says just at the end. I do not set aside the grace of God for if righteousness comes... If righteousness... Yes, that's right, sorry. I do not set aside the grace of God for if righteousness comes through, through the law, then Christ died in vain. Basically... If the gospel's not what saves you, if the gospel that we preach isn't the truth that saves a man or a woman, then Christ died for no reason. Now that's his final say on it. He's like, 
look, I can go over this over and over again and we can keep talking about the law and we can keep talking about grace. But if you think that we've got to add the law into this grace, Jesus died for no reason. And so what I'd say to you, if you think today that you need to bring someone else into the gospel to make you a believer or to make you saved walking with Jesus, it's not true. It's the simple gospel. And we'll finish on the simple gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For while you were sinners, Christ died. Christ died for each and every one of us. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Imagine a dirty table right now, that table right there. Imagine it dirty, put, put jam on it, put butter on it, put breadcrumbs, put everything on it. That table represents your life. All the mess on it represents the sin that has attached itself to your life. That sin will send you to hell. That sin will send you to destruction. That sin places you on the large path that leads to death. So Jesus comes along and he's just this white, clean cloth, just spotless, brand new flannel. Dips himself in the water. That can represent the blood. And he just goes over that table. He cleans that table. All of a sudden, you pull that flannel off. It's all on there. It's all on the white cloth. All the sin was laid upon him, but laid upon that white cloth. And you look at that table and it's no longer got any of that mess, that rubbish on. Well, your life has that mess and that rubbish on it if you have never given your life to Jesus and you don't follow him. Your life has that mess and that rubbish. And Jesus today wants to literally take himself and wipe your table Put all your sin, all your rubbish, everything onto him. Then he took it to the cross. He became obedient to death and he died. He was crucified. And if it had ended there, sin would have been back on top of you. But it didn't end there. Because three days later, he rose again. He defeated death. And you see, for all those that follow Jesus, accept him and say, Lord, come clean me, wash me clean. I choose to follow you. The word repentance, I no longer want to go this way, but I want to turn my eyes unto you, Jesus, and I want to walk with you from now on. You start to walk with Jesus. You go from that wide road that leads to death and you step over to the narrow path that leads to eternal life, that leads to Christ. It's the gospel plus nothing else gospel plus nothing else if there's anyone in this room that needs Jesus as Lord and Saviour you've never given your life to the Lord but you know today I need to do it stop playing with yourself give your head a wobble shake your heart and say Jesus let now be that moment for me if there's anyone in this room that doesn't know him as Lord and Saviour but today you say I want to know this Jesus you talk about. I want to step from that wide road onto the narrow road. And I don't care who sees. It's what I want to do. What every head is and every eye closed. Would you just, what every head is bad, every eye closed. Would you just raise your hand for me? I'm just going to quickly look around the room. It's for anyone that's not a follower of Jesus. If you do follow Jesus, you don't need to get involved. Just be praying for those that don't. Does anyone at all, just raise your hand that I may see. I'll quickly look around the room. I'm going to call the worship team straight up.